Okay, guys, as we jump into chapter 15 of Romans tonight, it's important for us to take a little bit of a look back and just get the historical perspective. It helps us to understand what what, uh, Paul is talking about in chapter 15 and what he wants us to understand. Uh, This letter was written to the church in Rome probably in the early spring of A.D. 57. And uh, Paul had been to the mission churches, actually uh, visiting there. And while he was there, he, he gathered an offering for the impoverished members of the church in Jerusalem. And so he had wanted to go to Rome for quite some time to visit that church and had longed to be there. But uh, he considered it a personal obligation and a personal commitment that he take that offering back to the church in Jerusalem. So, uh, not being able to go to Rome, he wrote this letter. And actually, he intended for this letter to prepare that church for a visit that he would make in the future uh, as he was going to be on mission to Spain. And so, uh, it's important to know about the... uh, the composition of that church in Rome, it had begun largely as a Jewish sect, but now Gentiles were coming into the church. And so a variety of cultural traditions and practices were all coming together in this same place of worship, and the people were struggling with that. Uh, It presented quite a number of relational challenges and, and they were so challenging to these people in their efforts to get along that it began to rob the church of hope and joy. And uh, so Paul's letter to the church was so on point and so timely for them. But man, how on point and how timely for us today. Um, By the time we get to chapter 15 in his letter, Paul has already confronted the Jews and the Gentiles in the church in Rome about their inherent sinful nature. All of them. All of us. Uh, He's told them, just as he tells us, that we have only been made righteous through Christ. Only through Christ. Now in chapter 15... Paul goes on and he's telling the Jews and the Gentiles and us how to practice righteousness in our relationships with each other. He's teaching them and us how to live in Christ's likeness according, we're talking about according to the standard of Christ. Paul, in ending his letter, actually verses that we'll look at tonight constitute the benediction of Romans. But in ending, he ends this letter with an appeal to the readers to work out their Christian faith in very, very practical ways. To work them out both in the church and in the world. He's calling the Christians in Rome to Christ-likeness. And as we've studied and talked over the last few weeks, He calls them to unity in the body of Christ. Unity in the body of Christ. And the steps that we're going to take tonight, the steps that we're going to look at, are those steps that bring us into that unity. So the first practical step toward righteousness for those in the body of Christ is to please one another. And that's our first division tonight. Okay, we're looking, we're going to look at verses. 1 through 6 of chapter 15 first. So if you don't have your Bibles open, man, open them up because there may be something there that you want to highlight tonight. (coughs) We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. For even Christ did not please Himself, but as it's written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me, have fallen on Christ. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the Scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement 
give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had. Hang on to that, guys. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had. So that with one mind and one voice you may glorify God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I like this old story about Sir Winston Churchill, whether it's true or not. But late in his life, Sir Winston took a cruise on an Italian ship. And a journalist from Rome asked the former Prime Minister why he chose to travel on the Italian line when the stately Queen's line under the British flag was available to him. <clears throat> Churchill thought for a moment and then he gravely replied, there are three things I like about Italian ships. First, their cuisine. It is unsurpassed. Second, their service. It's quite superb. And then Sir Winston added, and there's none of this nonsense about women and children first. <laughs> and why shouldn't women and children be first? And why shouldn't others in our life be first? Is it the gentlemanly thing to do to allow others to go first? Or is it the Christ-like thing to do to put others ahead of ourselves? But Paul tells us the Christ-like behavior is to please or build up one another. And you know, we can look at our own lives. Are we always wanting to be the first in line? Uh, do we always push to get ahead of others? In the grocery store, how about on I-35? How about at home? How about the restaurant after church? Uh, is that us? Or are we always looking out for the good of others? Or do we consider their interest above our own? Scripture is full of admonishments for us on this point. And remember, Paul has just told us that Scripture is where we get the teaching, the endurance, and the encouragement to act in Christ's likeness. But make a note of this, Philippians 2, 3, and 4 do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. <clears throat> Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also the interests of others. That's easy to do. Huh? Galatians 6 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Did we hear that right? The law of Christ? To bear, put up with, endure, and love? Galatians 6, 9 and 10, Let us not become weary in doing good, but at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Do good and reap good. You know, we all have to learn to put others ahead of ourselves. It does not come naturally. But it's the way of Christ. And think about this for a moment. If Christ had been selfish, He never would have left heaven in the first place. If Christ had been selfish, He would have rejected the cross. If Christ had been selfish, you and I would have no hope. What things can we do to please others? Man, it has got to be a discipline for us. What can we do to show others that we love them more than ourselves? And it's a practical discipline. We've got to engage in it. We've got to focus on pleasing one another. And the principle for our first division is just that. In our call to Christ's likeness, we are to please one another. 
in our applications, why do we consider some to, but, excuse me, why do we consider some believers unworthy of our interest or our <clears throat> compassion? I mean, we're talking about other members of the same body. We're talking about other members of the body of Christ. Why is it so difficult sometimes to even want to please them? Why is that? Our second practical step toward righteousness for those in the body of Christ is to accept one another. We're going beyond pleasing now, but we're talking about true acceptance. And that's the title for our next vision. In Christ's likeness, accept one another. These are verses 7 through 11. And it hits hard and fast, guys. You might want to highlight this. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed, and moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy. That's us. That we might glorify God for His mercy. As it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing the praises of your name. Again it says, Rejoice you Gentiles with His people. And again, praise the Lord all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples extol Him. To repeat just one more time, accept one another as Christ accepted you. It's amazing to think that God became flesh in Christ and dwelt among us to deliver a message of hope. And then, though sinless, Christ took all of our sin upon Himself and died so that you and I might live. Now that, my brothers, is acceptance. That is the standard of acceptance that we are called to. So how are we doing in that Christ-like standard of acceptance? How are we measuring up? Paul reminds the church in Rome, the Jews and the Gentiles, and us by this letter, we are all to praise God by our acceptance of each other. We are called to glorify God for His mercy toward all of us. We're called to rejoice and praise the Lord that we have been called into this body of Christ with all its members. You know, in Christian life, we're a family. When we exhibit godliness in our family, unbelievers want to be a part of it. But when we exhibit ungodliness in our family, unbelievers are affirmed in their unbelief. Our actions, our attitudes have consequences. In weeks past, we've talked about putting aside the disputable matters, those non-essentials. Those are the things that divide us. Those are the things that cause us to fail in Christ's likeness. If God our Father accepts someone as His child, then shouldn't you and I also be accepting them? You know, there's a story about an old pastor, Carl Ketcherside. He was born in 1908 in Cantwell, Missouri. He was baptized at the age of 12. He began preaching at the age of 13. And uh, he had a great love for books. And he was mostly self-educated. He went to business college for a couple of years, but no other college or university or seminary. Well, Carl was, uh, was a very wise and intellectual man and wrote uh, pretty prolifically. Uh, but at one time in his career, he wrote a book called The Twisted Scriptures. And the book was, was about him. It was about himself. It was about a practice that he had engaged in throughout his ministry as he considered himself to be more intellectual and superior to the rest of the members of the body of Christ. 
In his book, he attacked many interpretations of scriptural passages that he had so long upheld himself as the proof text to criticize and condemn other believers that he considered to be narrow-minded, not as astute as he had been. He eventually wrote, I have been in the wrong about fellowship all my life. Today I have renounced that wrong. I will no longer try to make my increasing knowledge consistent with my past teaching. <coughs> that past teaching was in error. So what's the error? Catcher Side has spent most of his career causing division within the body of Christ, and he acknowledged that. It was simply a matter of not accepting others who thought differently from him. For years, he had rejected other believers. Ultimately, he realized that he was called to build up the body of Christ. He was called to accept others who, who claimed Christ as their Lord and Savior. And gentlemen, you know, the situation is the same for us. If someone claims Christ as their Lord and Savior, then it's time for us to claim them. We must accept them as Christ accepted us. Now, sometimes accepting others is very, very difficult. On the morning of October 2nd, 2006, Charles Carl Roberts barricaded himself inside West Nickel Mines Amish School. After murdering five young girls and wounding six others, Roberts committed suicide. It was a dark day for the Amish community of West Nickel Mines. It was also a dark day for Marie Roberts, the wife of the gunman. And it was a dark day for her two young children. On the following Saturday, Marie went to her husband's funeral. She and her children watched in amazement as Amish families came and stood alongside them in the midst of their blinding grief. Despite the horrific crimes the man had committed against the Amish community, the Amish came to mourn with the widow and the children of Charles Carl Roberts. Now, I don't know if Marie Roberts and her children were Christians. I don't know if they were members at that time of the body of Christ. But I do know that the Amish made a remarkable demonstration of compassion, forgiveness, and acceptance by the body of Christ. The Amish knew Christ had accepted them. And guys, we also, we also know the story of another murderer. From Acts 9, he was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He scoured the country for members of the way, whether men or women, that he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And as you recall, this persecutor of the way <coughs> had a dramatic encounter with Christ. Jesus called this man his chosen instrument to carry the name of Jesus before the Gentiles and their kings and before all the people of Israel. Now, although Jesus called and accepted this persecutor, Jesus' disciples did not. To the disciples, it was not reasonable to believe that their feared enemy, Saul of Tarsus, could ever truly <laughs> be a member of the body of Christ. Then one of those God things happened. Barnabas the encourager, he listened to this Saul of Tarsus. In his listening, he heard and saw Christ in him. And with his encouragement, Barnabas led the other apostles to listen and see. Barnabas led the other apostles to to accept Saul of Tarsus, now Paul the Apostle, into the body of Christ. The same Paul that writes this letter to the Romans 
about righteousness through Christ. The same Paul that's teaching us these practical, though often very difficult, steps to Christ's likeness. Now guys, we may have some very, very good arguments to not accept others into the body of Christ. But when we start thinking that way, we've got to ask ourselves, is this the way of Christ? Is this the way of Christ? And we need to ask, in our acceptance or rejection, will we bring praise to God? We've got to ask in our acceptance or rejection, will we glorify God for His mercy? The principle of this division is simple. In our call to Christ's likeness, we are to accept one another. The applications are a little more challenging. Why have we refused to accept some believers in the body of Christ? And how do we rationalize that rejection? How can we justify that rejection? Our third practical step toward righteousness for those in the body of Christ is to join in hope. And we're looking at verses 12 and 13. In Christ's likeness, join in hope. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him the Gentiles will hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. A few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to visit with a man that had grown up in Medellin, Colombia. Or Medellin, as they call it, in Colombia. At one time, Medellin was the murder capital of the world one of the most violent, war-torn, drug abuse cities of all time. My new friend was explaining the remarkable transformation of Medellin and Colombia in recent years. And if you have followed the history down there, you know what a shocking past it has. Uh, but you also, if you followed it in recent years, it's, uh, it's had a pretty amazing transformation. In 2016, Gallup International ranked Colombia as the happiest country in the world. We're talking about two years ago, happiest country in the world. In 2013, Medellin was ranked as the most innovative city in the world. My friend attributed this astounding change in Medellin and Colombia to hope. He told me that Colombians have the unique ability to find hope almost anywhere. They can find it, and they hang on to it, they squeeze as much out of it as they can possibly get. In 2015, a Colombian cyclist won one stage of the Tour de France. That victory for one, we're not talking about winning the Tour de France, we're talking about winning one stage of the Tour de France. The victory of that stage sent the nation into national celebration. And recently, Colombia tied Peru one-to-one -one in football. And that winning goal is constantly rerun on television in celebration. My friend said that every time his father sees it, he gets goosebumps seeing Colombia score that tying goal. It's in these relatively insignificant victories that my friend claims that the nation has been transformed. It's in these victories that that nation has found hope, and it's in these victories that that nation is finding unity. But what does this Colombian hope say about our hope as members of the body of Christ? Will our hope cause us to join together in celebration as members of the body of Christ? Will our hope transform a nation Will our hope transform a world? Our hope is very, very different. Our hope begins with salvation. We have hope as we 
trust in Him. Our hope is not empty optimism, positive thinking, or blind trust. Our hope is in Christ and in His unfailing promises. Earlier in Romans, Paul reminded, reminded us that against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and became the father of many nations. We are anchored in that hope. We are firm and secure in that hope. That hope comes abundantly. We don't have to squeeze it out of anything. Jeremiah 29.11, where God promises, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And guys, we know the opposite of hope is despair. In fact, without God, life is meaningless, life is futile. Sigmund Freud acknowledged this. He said that as an atheist, I can only let my arms sink before the terrors of death. For Freud, death held no hope. He was convinced that, a death, that at death, he would cease to exist. <clears throat> Were it not for hope, our hearts would break. In hope, we no longer need to fear or obsess over death of ourselves, our loved ones. To live without hope is to cease to live at all. And in the body of Christ, we have a living hope that will guide us through this life with purpose and will usher us into eternity. Thankfully, guys, we're not dependent on the Tour de France or football victories for our hope. In the body of Christ, our hope overflows from the power of the Spirit, as Paul tells us. And gentlemen, our hope in Christ is the foundation of our family. In the family of God, we rejoice together in hope. The principle for our last division is in our call to Christ-likeness, we are to join in hope. In the applications, with what brothers, sisters in Christ do we not rejoice in hope? And how will we you how will we unite? the body of Christ in our rejoicing. Guys, we're an Easter people. And we're called to rise from the cultural and worldly influences and to become the presence of Christ. We're to please one another, accept one another, and join in the hope that is ours through Christ. Let's pray.